I'm going to start talking to you this evening about uh, what's called Christian, and the Christian's in quotes because it's, uh, it's a heresy, but to Christian Gnosticism. Now, uh, Pastor Darrell uh, mentioned when he's talking about canonicity about uh, a bunch of other good books that were, uh, were floating around, and um, I have this book from the 1600s. Uh, it includes... Um, uh, the, Epistle, uh, the Epistle of Barnabas, Ignatius, St. Clement, Polycarp, The Shepherd of Hermes, uh, The Martyrdom of uh, Ignatius and Polycarp. Uh, and so they've been, they've been floating around a long time. I also have there's little fragments of, uh, of things uh, floating around that uh, this is from the 4th and 5th century B.C., which would have been right when Gnosticism was really was really going uh, big, and uh, this is a portion of a book written in Greek. It's not a biblical book. Uh, but today, <clears throat> the reason that we've decided to do um, what Pastor is doing on Gnostic, or not Gnosticism, on canonicity, New Testament, and I've decided to do Gnosticism, is because uh, the National Geographic Society has moved from attacking us uh, on uh, the basis of evolution like they've done for years and years uh, to uh, really making big deals out of Gnostic books like uh, the gospel, so-called gospel of Judas, uh, real, really popular today. We probably won't get to it tonight, uh, but the Gnostic discoveries, um, this talks about the discoveries at Nag Hammadi. We might be able to, to get there this evening. It depends how things go. And then uh, the supposed lost gospels, uh, and uh, people today are becoming somewhat confused, particularly uh, with that fictional book that we'll be talking to you about later uh, in the week. I have a PowerPoint presentation called The Da Vinci Code. Any of you heard that? Okay, The Da Vinci Code and The Da Vinci Movie. I have a PowerPoint presentation I've given different places around the United States that We'll be showing you as well. So turn to your study notes. Try and lay a foundation for you. Um, very early, in fact, as soon as the New Testament books were written, uh, almost immediately there was an effort by uh, the enemy, the enemies of Jesus Christ, the enemies of the gospel, to corrupt those books. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Second Corinthians chapter two, verse seventeen. While uh, things are written in your notes. It's always better to look at it in the context of the Scripture. But in the book of Second Corinthians, in chapter 2, in verse 17, it says, and I want you to watch it closely because uh, you all know that uh, the book is written by Paul because it says in chapter 1, verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. It tells us who wrote this book. We don't have to guess about it like we do with Hebrews, but it says here, For we are not as many which, what? Corrupt the Word of God. Already, in Paul's time, there were people who were corrupting the Word of God. And I, I think that the word corrupt is a very interesting word in the Greek. It actually is the word, we don't use it much anymore, but it's the word huckster. It's the word huckster in the Greek. Now, he feared to do a careful word study on that, and I like, I like this. Uh, the word was commonly used in the days of the disciple of a wine merchant who was a huckster. What he would do was take inferior, crummy-tasting wine, mix it with some spices and some good wine, and then he would peddle his corrupted version to the people around and through the wine stores. That's where the word corrupt or huckster comes from. And so you say, well, how does it refer to the Word of God? Well, that's easy. Hucksters took the pure Word of God, and like the wine dealers, they mixed it with their own philosophies, they mixed it with their own opinions, they mixed it with their own perversion, and then they peddled it as the real thing. And that happened very early on. We also know that false gospels and false letters were uh, being written and circulated, and we know this. Turn with me in your Bibles to Second Thessalonians chapter two and verse two. It says that you be 
not soon shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, what some people say, 2 Thessalonians 2, 2, nor by letter as from us. By the way, who wrote 2 Thessalonians? The Apostle Paul wrote 2 Thessalonians. So, the Apostle Paul says that there was a letter either under his name or whoever was with him that was being circulated saying this was a letter from him. And he says, don't be troubled because it's not from us. And it was claiming that it was him, but it was a fake, it was a fraud, and it was bogus. And now take your Bibles and turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1 through 3. In 2 Peter chapter 2, in verse 1 through 3, but it says, There were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you. Now watch what happens. Who secretly, that's the word privately, that's what it means, who privately or privily, Bring in damnable heresies, denying the Lord that bought them. We're going to already, there was the development, beginning development of these Gnostic type of heresies that were going on. We'll talk about a little bit more because they don't believe in the same Jesus Christ that was spoken of in in the scriptures. It says, and bring upon themselves swift destruction and many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be spoken evil of, verse 3, and through covetousness shall they with feigned words, they're word twisters. Because if you look at the word feigned, it's the word where we get our word plastic, plastos, with plastic, with molded words, with feigned words they make merchandise of you, whose judgment now for a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. These false prof, uh, prophets and teachers <clears throat> were bringing in damnable heresies. How? Well, certainly by their spurious teachings, but also I believe that they were writing these things down, and we'll prove it a little bit later, and they were circulating them very slick. They were circulating them. Now, let's uh, look at an overview of two of uh, the most important Gnostic heresies uh, that uh, come in very, very early in the days of the apostles and shortly afterwards. Um, uh, Actually, uh, I believe that we see that they were aware of these false teachings that were coming in. Uh, It's alluded to in uh, the epistles of John, Paul, and Jude. And Galatians, for instance, Galatians 1, verse 6 through 8 it says, I marvel. Now, here's people in the churches of Galatia that Paul had led to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's writing them back and he's saying, I am literally flabbergasted uh, that ye have so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto what? Another gospel. Another gospel. Now, we're going to see in just a minute that there was a number of different Gospels. There was the Gospel of Peter, and there was the Gospel of uh, of Judas, and a bunch of these other Gospels. Unto another Gospel, he says, which is not another Gospel, but there be some that trouble you who would pervert the Gospel of Christ. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach unto you any other Gospel than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Someone, a number of people, were promoting false gospels in the church of Galatia. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 3, it says, And every spirit... Now, I want you to know that every word of God is pure. God gave us uh, His breathed word. It says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And is profitable. Uh, <clears throat> and heaven and earth shall pass away, Jesus Christ said, but my words shall not pass away. It's not like that famous book from the mind of God to the mind of man. Well, wait a minute. Are words important? I, uh, uh, I suggest to you that not only are words important, I suggest to you that even jots and tittles are important. 
even the minutest are important. And, and so, watch this. Back in 1 John chapter 4, it says, Every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Now, you say, <clears throat> yeah, big deal. We know all about that. But let me tell you something. With the Gnostics, as we will see, they separate Jesus as being physical from the Christ being spiritual. And in their false teachings, they say that they are not one and the same. Uh, they say that the Christ left Jesus uh, when he was crucified. Came on him at baptism, left him when he was crucified, so only a physical person was crucified. They got some weird teachings. I'm here to tell you that there was a hypostatic union. Jesus Christ was 100% God, 100% man. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. That's what the Word of God says. Not this Gnostic business. And so John is writing because he's worried about people who are separating the Jesus from the Christ, the physical from the spiritual, I believe here. So it says, that confesseth not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist. Let me tell you, the spirit of Antichrist is here today. Gnosticism is reviving. Dan Brown's The Da Vinci Code has just just really stirred that up. He says it's a fiction book. Yeah, but right in the front he says everything that I say in the book is true. You know, all these things are true. And and look at Jude, beloved, verse 3 and 4. When I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints. You need to know what the faith was. It says, there are certain... It says, for there are certain men crept in unawares. They, they kind of weaseled themselves in. It says, who were before of old ordained unto this condemnation, ungodly men, now watch this, turning the grace of God into what? Lasciviousness, sensuality, and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, You'll find out that there's a sect of the Gnostics when we come to it because they also separate the, the flesh from the spirit. See, Gnostics are really just pantheists in the thin disguise. And I'll explain what that is in a minute. But uh, there's a bunch of the Gnostics, what they said is, well, it really doesn't matter what you do with your body because your body's evil anyway. So they didn't care. Fornication, immorality, drunkenness. All that kind of stuff didn't matter because it's only the spirit that went to heaven because the flesh was evil anyway. Nothing you could do with that. They just wanted to get rid of that flesh as quickly as they could. Now, we're going to look at three of the early heresies. Um, I, I don't know. I guess it's called docetism uh, and Marcanism. And then both of those were types of Gnosticism. Then we're going to look at Gnosticism itself. But let's, let's look at docetism first. Uh, and, uh, you, you know, uh, suffice it to say uh, that uh, there's, there's so many types of Gnosticism. I, when I got into this, I, I took some of the key ones. There's so many varieties, uh, you can't hit them all. But it dates back to the apostolic times, and it comes from the Greek word uh, dokus which means appearance or semblance. Now, here's why they're called uh, docetists. Here's why. Uh, they, uh, as we look at this, uh, they, this particular brand taught that Jesus, or not Jesus, excuse me, that Christ's body was a phantom. That he did not have a real physical body. Some denied the reality of Christ's human nature altogether, and some only the reality of his human body uh, and of his birth and of his death. Now, um, <clears throat> you say, wait a minute, how could that be? That's foolishness. Well, to be sure, it's foolishness, because it isn't what the New Testament teaches, but... You know, they could have got their idea. Remember in Genesis chapter 19, 
uh, when the angels came to uh, uh, was it Sodom, and they thought they were what? Men. They thought they were men. All right. So, um, well, very interestingly enough, uh, the word docete can also be rend- rendered illusionists. Um, in a letter, an old letter, a letter to Serapion, the bishop of Antioch, this was, he lived from 190 to 203, or no, that's about the time that the letter was written. Uh, and uh, he, was a, he was a pastor of the church, <clears throat> and there had been troubles that had arisen in the church. Now, here it is. Pastor Darrell mentioned it. Here's why there was difficulty in those canon lists. Because of an apocryphal gospel of what? Of Peter. They said, hey, this is a letter from Peter. Uh, well, <clears throat> Serapion at first unsuspectingly allowed it to be read in his church. But later on, he forbade it and because uh, he borrowed a copy and used it. And, and he called it, he said that he got the copy from the docete. And, in other words, he got this doctored copy, this perverted copy, called the Gospel of Peter, uh, from this group. Now, there's another variety of, of docetism, and, and uh, because they didn't all have consistent doctrines, but they fall in, in the same. And I was talking to you about a little bit earlier. Uh, they said that there is, is Christ was twofold in nature; that he was spiritual and physical. Now, Jesus, they said, was the physical, and Christ was the spiritual. And they say that Christ departed, uh, Jesus, the crucifixion, and left him on the cross to suffer and die. Now, they know nothing of a literal, physical, bodily resurrection. If you remember First Baptist Church, we believe in a literal, physical, bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. And when Jesus Christ arose from the dead, and he came unto Thomas, and he said to Thomas, Come here, Thomas, stick your finger where? In my hand, and thrust your hand in my side. Thomas didn't do that. He recognized Jesus Christ for who he was, because Jesus Christ literally, physically, bodily rose from the dead. But you see, they believe that only the Christ, his spirit, went back to God. Jesus Christ just died. He was dead. His physical body, there wasn't any physical resurrection at all. There wasn't... wasn't any any of that. Uh, that's certainly different than what we we read in the New Testament, isn't it? Colossians chapter two and verse six through nine. It says, As ye have therefore received Jesus Christ the Lord, so walk ye in him. Who is he? He's Jesus Christ the Lord, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving, and then it warns. It warns. It warns about what things the docetists were talking about. It says, uh, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceits after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. And then right in that same context, it says, For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead. What? Bodily. What do you have there? You have the hypostatic union. Jesus Christ. I know we don't understand it. He was fully God and fully man. Amen? I mean, he was. But here are these docetists, and they got this all worked out, that Jesus over here, Christ over here, and uh, uh, they have a completely different understanding. Uh, I like Hebrews chapter 10. It just makes me really appreciate what God did for us, because I want to tell you, the Son of God was eternal, uh, and then he took on a body for us so that he could die for our sins. But Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5 through 12, Wherefore... When he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but look at this now, but a body thou hast prepared for me. God gave him a body. Amen? Now, what was he going to do with that body? Slip down to verse 10. You can look at all the stuff in between. But verse 10, it says, By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the what? Body of Jesus? No, Jesus what? Christ. How many times? Once, and uh, for all is in italics, however, the Greek context of once means, it's, it's, in the te- it's in the tense that means once and for all. One time, 
forever. You know what that does? That does away with the Mass. Because the Mass, they're crucifying Jesus Christ over again. Luke chapter 24, verse 39. Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. He comes and asks them, <clears throat> handle me and see for... Now watch this. It's very interesting what the Gnostics do with this. This isn't a Gnostic scripture. See, they have a bogus loop, by the way. For a uh, spirit hath not flesh and what? Bones. As ye see me have, did Jesus Christ have flesh and bones? Yes, he did. Uh, but not, not according to the Gnostics. The Gnostics was the biggest challenge from 150 to about 300, the biggest challenge to Christianity. Docetetic Gnosticism, uh, they wrote their own Gospels. They included the Acts of John. Not really written by John, but the Acts of John. They had the Gospel of Peter. And the Gospel of Peter was cited by Justin Martyr, Origen, Eusebius. But we didn't have even a fragment of this. I think God's so good. Look at it. I mean, do you realize that there are over 5,700 Greek manuscripts or portions of the New Testament? Do you understand that? And do you know how many uh, Gospels of Peter there are? A portion that was found in 1886. Okay? Uh, they were excavating the grave of a monk, monk and a French archaeological, archaeological team discovered this manuscript in Egypt. Only a small portion of it remains. But what does remain gives a different account of the crucifixion than the four Gospels. See, what they do is they separate the Christ from Jesus. And it's seen in this quotation. Here is a quotation from that manuscript that was found in 1886. And you see if you can uh, realize how it's different from what we have in the Gospels. For many went about with lamps, supposing it was night, and fell down. And the Lord cried, My power, my power, thou hast forsaken me. Hmm. You know what it says in the Scriptures? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And when he had said it, he was taken up. And in that hour, the veil of the temple of Jerusalem was rent in twain. According to uh, docetic teaching, the power of Jesus, the Christ, left him while he was on the cross. See, there's no resurrection, bodily resurrection with Gnostics. See, it's just that spirit thing. And I'm here to tell you... Turn with me to Acts chapter 1. I ain't, I'm not buying this Gnostic garbage. Uh, you shouldn't buy it either. Either They got all kinds of twists and turn. All kinds of, of things. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. I love this. But ye shall receive power. Who's speaking? The Lord. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of, his, out of their sight. This wasn't any spirit. This was the literal, physical, resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven... As he went up, behold, two men stood by them in, in white apparel, which also said, <laughs> I love it, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into the heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Let me ask you a question. Is this talking about a literal, physical, bodily resurrection or a spiritual one? It's talking about a literal, physical, bodily resurrection. And you know what? I'm looking 
for him to come back the same way that they saw him go. In fact, I want to do some practice. Because one day the dead in Christ shall rise, and then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. You'd think I was Pentecostal. Amen! <laughs> All right. Scared everybody half to death. Okay. Uh, so, uh, I, I just, uh, uh, you know, the account of the resurrection in the Gospel of Peter is also uh, docetic, and I, I'm not going to take the time to read that to you. You can read it for yourself. But what I want you to see uh, also is that the docetists used an altered version of the Gospel of Mark, page 4, top. Um, <clears throat> you know, if, if you've got one of those, if you've got a new modern version... Uh, I was going to go through see if I could find my NIV. Um, couldn't lay my hands on it. Probably just as well. But anyway, when you come to the end of Mark chapter 16, uh, you have 9 through 20, uh, that there's a line there, I believe, and, and it says they're not in the oldest and the best manuscripts. Do you know where they got that from? The Gnostics. Do you realize that Gnostic corruption is in the Alexandrian line of manuscripts, and that's why they're different than the traditional manuscripts, the Texas Receptus, the Apostolic, the Byzantine, the TR? Let's just let me show you. The Docetists had a different version of the Gospel of Mark. Uh, Irenaeus, um, Irenaeus, however you want to pronounce it. And he says this, and this is from his work. It's a wonderful work against heresies. It's tough reading, but it's a good work. Those who separate Jesus from Christ and say that Christ remained impassable while Jesus suffered and try to bring forward the gospel according to Mark can be corrected out of that saying that the Gospel of Mark was corrected, that can be removed out of that, if they will read it with a love of the truth. Irenaeus is saying right there, they have doctored the book of Mark. Now, Latin manuscript K also reflects the tampering in the book of Mark. Uh, Dr. Edward F. Hill notes, the altered version of Mark 16.4 reads as following K. Suddenly, moreover, at the third hour of the day, darkness fell on the whole world, and the angels descended from heaven. Uh, and, and as the Son of God was rising in brightness, they ascended at the same time with him, and straightway it was light. Now, this verse from K matches the citations from the Gospel of Peter, which is a uh, which is a Gnostic book. It also contains, look at this, and here's what I was talking about. It also contains the, uh, it, it not contains, it, it also has the short ending of Mark, Mark 16, which omits 9 through 20, uh, as many of the modern day translations of the Greek do. I would suggest to you that Mark, the Mark used in many of the modern day translations rely upon manuscripts that were tampered with by the Gnostics, or particularly the Docetic Gnostics. Well, we can conclude that the Docetic Gnostics altered uh, and used copies of Mark, uh, which are like many contemporary translations that we have today. You see, many of my people have heard me say the oldest manuscripts aren't necessarily the best. Because when did the corruptions come in? The corruptions came in shortly after the true books were written. You have these uh, docetic Gnostics 
who are altering Mark, who write their own Peter, and then uh, they they circulate these like those false wine merchants and try and get the people to believe it's a real thing. A Markanism, a Markanism here. Uh, Markon was born in well, some sources say 85 A.D. Some say 110. I wasn't there. So I'm just saying he was born there sometime between 85 and 110. Nobody knows for sure. But he founded his own Gnostic-oriented sect. And remember what I said to you, and I want you to remember over and over and over again, that Gnostics are just thinly disguised pantheists, uh, thinly veiled pantheists. And what's a pantheist? A pantheist believes that God is in everything. God is in you, and God is in the tree, and God is in the rocks, and God is in the stars, and God is in the wind, and God is in... That's what a Gnostic is. Uh, God is all, and all is God, is one of, one of the pantheistic sayings. And uh, it's, it's, it's really, uh, really a, a far cry from what we have in the Bible. But here's what he taught, and here's what's very interesting... Actually, Markon was very anti-Semitic. And you know what that means when I say anti-Semitic. He was anti-Jewish. He was anti-Jewish because um, he wouldn't have anything to do with the Old Testament. Uh, The Old Testament, uh, he said, could not have been from the Father of Jesus because Christ speaks of his Father as a God of love, uh, but the God of the Jews was a god of wrath. Uh, Markon taught that uh, Jehovah, the god of the Old Testament, uh, created the world, but that all created flesh was evil. Remember, they had this dichotomy. Uh, They believed that all flesh, all created things, um, all temporal things, uh, all things of substance were evil. And so evil Jehovah created all these things and that our bodies are evil. Now, it is true that we're all, we've all sinned, but there's a difference between saying uh, your body's all evil and there's nothing you can do with it. And that's what a lot of Gnostics did, say your body's evil, there's nothing that can do with it. It's only your spirit that can be redeemed. So your, your body can lust and your body can be immoral and your body can overeat and your body can do all these things because it doesn't matter. It's evil anyway. Only this God inside of you uh, moves on to be reunited with God. The soul and the spirit of man uh, was uh, created by a greater God. See, now, this is what makes Gnostic idolaters. uh, Because they're saying that there's another God above Jehovah God. Uh, And um, and that's that's exactly what they say. This greater God created the spiritual realm and was the true father of Jesus. <clears throat> to release man's soul from his flesh, the greater God sent Christ. Christ appeared in the form of a 30-year-old man in a spiritual body. Remember, they claimed that Jesus Christ did not have flesh and bone. But the Bible says when Jesus Christ arose from the dead, he says, a spirit doesn't have flesh and bones as you see that I have. Uh, and so they're, they're way off, but that's what they believed. It was a spiritual body that appeared to be physical, but was not physical. And here was how salvation was gained by uh, the Marcanists. Salvation was gained through renouncing Jehovah and all things physical. As I already mentioned to you, Marcon rejected the Hebrew Scriptures and the quotations of those Hebrew Scriptures in the New Testament. <clears throat> now, there's a big problem here. Uh, if you were to say that this would be early Christian belief. Uh, number one, uh, these things came after all of the Old Testament Scriptures that had been written, but they came after all of the New Testament Scriptures that had been written the teachings of Marcon. And, by the way, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, in Matthew chapter 4, 
Uh, when he's face to face with the devil, he quotes Deuteronomy again and again and again. And so you see, uh, these followers are all wet. But the followers of Marcon issued their own New Testament composed of Luke and Paul's letters revised to their liking. Actually, it didn't include a couple of Paul's letters, but it included, included most of Paul's letters. So their whole New Testament was Luke and uh, most of the Pauline epistles. The followers of Marcon made their revisions to support their doctrines. Now, uh, <clears throat> they're not the, the last ones to do that. I have in my office uh, a, uh, a Douay Reims um, Bible issued by the Catholic Church. And, uh, you know, it's very clear. How many of you would say that you, you would recognize the Lord's Prayer if I said it to you? Would you, would you do that? Well, okay. Uh, in Wycliffe's uh, 1380 New Testament, it says, Give us this day our daily bread, the bread of our substance. Uh, in Tyndale's 1525 uh, New Testament, it says, Give us this day our daily bread. In the Matthew's Bible, it says, Give us this day thy daily bread. In the Geneva Bible, it says, Give us this day our daily bread. In the King James Version of the Bible, it says, Give us this day our daily bread. In the, in the Douay Reims Bible, it says, Give us this day our super substantial bread. Now, you see what they're trying to do? They're trying to support their doctrine of transubstantiation. And yet all the other English versions of the Bible don't say anything like that. And see, uh, any of you, I hope you don't, but any of you have a New World Translation of the Bible besides myself and Pastor Darrell? You say, well, what is that? That's the Jehovah Witness Bible. Why do we have it? Because we believe it. I think he has one. I don't know whether he has one or not. But anyway, um, but you know... um, it says in our Bible, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, John 1.1. 1, 1. You know what it says in the Jehovah Witness Bible? It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. Now, only one letter, friends, only one letter, just one letter, but does it make a difference? Indeed, and the Word was God, and the Word was a God. Now, I want you to know something. Very honestly, you know where the Jehovah Witnesses got this? From the Gnostics. Because they didn't believe that Jesus Christ was the God. They believed that Jesus Christ was an A-E-O-N, an Aeon. Uh, They believe that this superior God above Jehovah created a bunch of lesser gods to do his bidding and Jesus was one, and Sophia was another, and there was a bunch of them there. And uh, uh, the fact of the matter is, as you go back and uh, some of the corrupted texts that the, the Jehovah Witnesses base their Greek translation on comes from Gnostic corruption that happened uh, very early on. Ultimately, these Marconius' revisions reflected private interpretations And these perversions have survived in some of the Greek New Testament manuscripts and account for the differences between the eclectic Greek text, as Pastor Darrell was talking about that. You know what eclectic means? They pick and choose, and they pick and choose. That's what eclectic means. And you know what the Textus Receptus is? Well, it is the text, the 5,000 and some Greek text that underlie, underlie our King James Version of the Bible. Now, let me explain. Uh, Irenaeus, uh, Irenaeus, however you want to pronounce it, points out that uh, Marcon cut up the gospel according to Luke. Where did I get that? Well, I've got this neat new program on my computer, and it has all of the Ananasian fathers and Postnasian fathers on it, and so you can do searches through all this kind of stuff. Instead of having to read the 52 volumes and search out all the things, you can find little portions. But this was in Irenaeus' Against Heresy on page 382. Irenaeus said that this Gnostic, uh, uh, Marcon, cut up the Gospel of Luke. This would account for the large number of changes 
found in varying manuscripts of Luke and the large number of verses that are left out. Uh, It is, for example, understandable why the phrase, and when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. That's Luke 2440. That's how come it is left out in Marikon's Gospel of Luke. Why? Well, you remember, they didn't believe in the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ. They only believed in a spiritual resurrection. And my friends, this is why it's so important. I'm going to hit it again this evening. That you understand and never are talked out of the fact that Jesus Christ was God in the flesh and he died and he rose again, literally, physically, actually, the third day. In other words, he rose again with a real body. It was a glorified body. He's called the the first fruits of them that slept. But you see, there's a divinity school down the road uh, near Chicago, and there's a professor there who doesn't believe in in the, the, the literal resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's, he says it's just spiritual. What is that? That's the old Gnostic heresy. And uh, that's getting shot through in a lot of churches today. But here's an interesting fact. And, and um, this is the reason that we still use the King James Version of the Bible here. As long as I'm here, as long as Pastor Darrow's here, we're going to use it. I hope that everybody who comes after it will will use it because... The apparatus in the United Bible Society's Greek text. Now, that's explaining how they get their eclectic text. Now, I think the United Bible Society, I'm, I'm trying to think what, what revision they're in. Um, there's a lot of revisions in, in, in these, but in, in their notes, in their apparatus, of, of this corrupted Greek text that all the modern texts are translated from, and that missionaries, when they go to the field, they use the UBS Greek texts most of the time, it points out that this verse is omitted by a Marcon and Codex D. Why did they do that? Because that's why they say the oldest, and they say the best, I say it might be older, but they're corrupted. They're corrupted. And where did they get it corrupted from? It got corrupted. Luke got corrupted, and it got into some of these Western manuscripts, got some into these Egyptian manuscripts. These corruptions of Luke and other books of the Bible got in there, uh, and that's what is used in the New English Bible today uh, and in the Revised Standard Version of the Bible, in the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. Thus, we see that Codex D which is a Western line manuscript of the gospel as opposed to the Eastern line, the Texas Receptus, Um, they reflect the tampering that was done all the way back in 144 A.D. by Marcon. And so you wonder why we stick with the King James. I'll tell you why. Because it's from the uncorrupted line. It doesn't have the Gnostic heresy in it. There were many other Christian Gnostic sects that existed between 150 and 300. Besides the two I have named, uh, there was the Valentinians, there was the Simonians, there was the Ophites that Pastor Darrell uh, mentioned, and then there was the B-A-S-I-L-I-D-I-A-N-S, the Silididians. There was the Canites, there was the Nicolites. Oh, there was many, many more. And, and um, so there is... The early heresy. You say, well, why are you talking about early heresy? I want to tell you why I'm talking about an early heresy today. Let me find it here in your notes later on. Uh, in this, uh, page 10. Turn with me to page 10. This is Darrow's type for me, two articles out of a World Magazine. And I want you to see what the lead line, the first line, the first paragraph is. Gnosticism is probably hotter now than it has been since well over 1,500 years ago, friends, Gnosticism, as a result of the Da Vinci Code, you see, the reason I'm telling you all this kind of stuff is because when I go into the Da Vinci Code stuff tomorrow, 
You know what the Da Vinci Code is? The Da Vinci Code is a Gnostic fairy tale. It's a Gnostic novel. It is a novel that goes back and pulls from uh, these Gnostic texts. How do I know? Because Dan Brown in the Da Vinci Code says that he relies on some of the Nag Hammadi texts. And if you want to know what the Nag Hammadi texts are, Nag Hammadi is in Egypt. If you'll turn back to page 8 here, here are the Gnostic Nag Hammadi texts that were found in Nag Hammadi um, around the, uh, 1945, I believe it is, and uh, we talk a little bit about there. But these are all Gnostic texts. They found the Gospel of Thomas and the Gospel of Philip, uh, the Acts of Peter, the Twelve Apostles, the letters to Peter and to Philip, the, the Apocalypse of Peter and Paul. And let me just tell you something. I also want to turn your attention to another article that is, that is in, in this, uh, and it's on page 13. It's from World Magazine again. It's called The Return of the Canaanites. And if you look on page 13, uh, the third paragraph down, I want you to see this. I, I do want you to see this. No serious scholar, even the most liberal variety, believe this text. What's it talking about? It's talking about the Gospel of Judas. What's the Gospel of Judas? The Gospel of Judas is one that they did a whole National Geographic magazine on. I have it in my office and... And uh, very interesting, uh, um, <clears throat> you say, well, what do we have to worry about it? Well, a Methodist pastor gave a devotional in uh, his uh, uh, nursing home time from the Gospel of Judas. Now, why would they do that when no serious scholar is going to accept that as being anything but a Gnostic heresy? Um, well, I'll tell you why. Because uh, when people aren't born again, if you don't stand for something, you're going to fall for anything. And uh, thankfully, uh, we know the truth, and if we study the truth, the truth can make us free. Now back to page 5, because I'm not going to come back to these notes again. There's far more than I can cover for you uh, in, the, in the next 15 minutes that I'm talking, so you're going to have to read them for yourself because I want to move on. Uh, tomorrow to the presentation of uh, Da Vinci Code. How many have seen that presentation I've done already? Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six. Six of you are going to get a repeat then tomorrow. Um, <clears throat> let's look at Gnosticism in general. Uh, it's likely that Carpocrates was the founder of, quote, Christian, end quote, Gnosticism in the first half of the second century, about 150. Uh, or a little bit before. The earliest and most vivid accounts of Carpocrates can be found again in Irenaeus. You see, he wrote a big, long... You know, you know preachers that are worth their salt warn, warn their sheep about heresies. And that's what Irenaeus did. He warned them against the Gnostic heresy. Now, uh, they did not believe that Jesus Christ was divine. You know what that means. They didn't believe that Jesus Christ was God. Gnostics in general. Uh, uh, now, I, I also need to tell you that the Gnostics themselves, they had such a broad diversity of doctrine. I'm just picking out some of the things that most all of them agreed on. Uh, and uh, this, was, this was one of them, that Jesus Christ wasn't divine. His followers did not believe, listen to this, that they had to follow the law of Moses or any morality, they live very licentious, immoral um, in their behavior. Very, very immorally in their behavior. Why? They believed their flesh was evil. There was nothing they could do with it. Only their spirit was saved so they could go and do what they wanted to. Wait just a minute. Galatians chapter 5 says very clearly... If you walk in the Spirit, ye shall not fulfill what? The lust of the flesh. So if you're going to walk in the Spirit, if they wanted to walk in the Spirit, if they would walk in the Spirit, they would be filled with love, joy, peace, patience, long-suffering, goodness, meekness. Against such there is no law. However, 
they just decided to have a reason to uh, just be lawbreakers and live like they wanted to. And so they had the Galatians 5.19 things. Turn with me to Galatians chapter 5 and verse 19. Their lives were filled full of adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, sedition, wrath, strife, sedition, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, and revelings, and the such like. And I want to tell you something. It says, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not, what? Inherit the kingdom of God. Well, all right. Gnostics, Gnosticism in all this variety, now listen to this, was the most influential heresy faced by the early church. Not only did the Gnostics corrupt many readings found in the New Testament, but they offered their own writings as inspired scripture. And there's just a, a, a list of them there. The Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Peter, the Gospel of Philip, the Gospel of Judas, the Gospel of the Ebonites, the Gospel of the Twelve, the Gospel according to the Hebrews. That's also called the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew. Um, and not to be confused with the real Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel according to the Egyptians, the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, the Acts of Andrew, the Acts of Peter, the Acts of John, and more and more and more. Gnosticism had a variety of forms and sects which broadened its base and its growth. And this guy, Will Durant, uh, I'm a student of history, I have a Ph.D. in history, so if you know much about history, you know Will Durant. Real, Will Durant wasn't a Christian man, but Will Durant calls the Gnostics the quest of, uh, the quest of godlike knowledge through mystic means. You see, they were pantheists. They were, they were mystics. Uh, Durant's correct, and I've said this over and over again. That's why it is in bold print. Gnosticism is thinly veiled pantheism. And pantheism is that doctrine that says uh, God is all and all is God. Pan, uh, all, and theos, God. Now, as in docetism and Marcanism, Gnosticism taught that uh, the physical, the material is evil and the the, the spiritual, non-material is good. Uh, and uh, again, as we get down here, we read, it says, Some, uh, so the Gnostics, uh, the Gnostic God created a being, a line of beings. Remember, the Gnostic God was above the God of the Bible. That's what they say. And he created a, a, a group of beings called aeons, and Jesus Christ was one of these aeons. Turn with me to page 6. The influence of Gnosticism, second paragraph down, can be seen in some of the heresies today. For example, many of the teachings stated above are found in revised form of the Jehovah Witnesses. Jehovah Witnesses say that Jesus is a created God, not God, manifest in the flesh. It's little wonder that the Watchtower New World Translation omits God was manifest in the flesh. They don't, they don't want you to see that. God was manifest in the flesh because they believe that God wasn't flesh. You got it? They believe it was all spiritual. It was a phantom. In 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, they replace it with, he was made manifest in the flesh. And there's a whole difference that I explain a little bit. And here's another Gnostic heresy. In John chapter 1 and verse 18, the New World Translation and many notes in the New Translations and in the NASV, uh, it does the same thing. It reads, the only begotten God. Turn with me to John chapter 1, verse 18 in, in your, your, your Bibles. John chapter 1, verse 18. It says, no man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten what? Son, which is in the bosom of the Father. He hath declared him. Very, very interesting here. Uh, the Greek text of the New World Translation um, would 
be one that says only begotten God. And God cannot be begotten. The King James says only begotten Son. What is amazing is that both of these examples, the NASV, the New American Standard Version, agrees with the New World Translation because both are based on the Gnostic text. So what you have is the Gnostic false doctrine was influential on these various manuscripts. The phrase only begotten God is supported by Clement of Alexandria, Origen, Jerome, and in P66, that's a, a fragment uh, of, of the Bible, and uh, the Alexandrian line of manuscripts. The only begotten Son is quoted by Christosom, Tertullian, Basel, and the Old Latin and the Old Syrian that Pastor talked to you about, and the majority of Greek manuscripts. So... What I want you to see very clearly is, is that when Dan Brown brings to the forefront all of his questions about the Bible, all he is doing is reintroducing old-time Gnosticism. Uh, read what they believe about God. We don't have time to this evening. Read what they believe about salvation. And my friends, you'll see... Uh, that it is the uh, heresy to the highest degree, and you can't, by any stretch of the imagination, call Gnosticism Christian. However, <coughs> today, that's <coughs> very common in National Geographic. Uh, the scholars of the universities call it Christian Gnosticism, and they start reading the Christian writings to see what early Christianity was all about. Well, this isn't early Christianity for one thing. Uh, the earliest Christians were the apostles and the prophets and those that came before. This came 50 to 200 years after all of that. And yet, as the preacher said in Ecclesiastes, you know what our duty is? Fear God. Keep his commandments, for that's the whole duty of man. Gnostics don't think you have to do that. They think you can live a licentious life. But the Bible says, and Peter wrote, be holy for what? I am holy.